Yo, what is going on guys? Welcome to the video. Today we are counting down at number 18 in our worst to best Overwatch League team series. I know it's been a few days since I uploaded the last one, but honestly, this list is very hard guys. And coming in at number 18, we do have the Boston Uprising. And my god, did I struggle when I was going through the potential teams for this ranking. But I do, at the end of the day, believe that Boston Uprising will be the 18th best team going into the next season of the Overwatch League. Many factors do come into my decision at putting Boston Uprising here. And in this video, I will go through them all. Obviously, Boston Uprising is the first team on my list so far that was competing in Season 1. So that does mean this video will be formatted a little bit differently. But nonetheless, Boston Uprising is number 8. If you guys are excited to watch this video and you love the series I'm doing, be sure to subscribe to stay updated. Also, we're doing a massive Overwatch League giveaway, so you'll want to click that button for that. Now, let's go ahead and jump into it, and let's start off with the Boston Uprising's performance in Season 1, because it was extremely unexpected, and I couldn't find one person that thought Boston Uprising would actually make the playoffs. Hell, even I made a video before the Overwatch League started and said Boston Uprising could win the championship, but to be honest, I don't even know if I believed that at the time. I just knew that they did have some hidden talents and because of those hidden talents they performed very well in season one they caught a lot of teams off guard and by the end of it they were one of the top performers they definitely had some hidden gems during season one but the problem now going into season two is that most of those hidden gems are gone or at least the key ones are Let's talk about the major factor why I believe Boston Uprising was a top team in Season 1. There's three of them. The first is Striker, the second is Dream Casper, and the third is Note. Starting off with the first two. Long story short, they're gone now. So that's a reason why Boston Uprising is in trouble. And the replacements for number one and number two are absolutely underwhelming. And yes, I do understand that there is a chance that Boston Uprising is just incredible at scouting unknown talent, just like they did in Season 1 with Striker and Dream Casper. Now they did it again, signing Blossé and Color Hex. They're going to be these two incredible DPSs that come out of nowhere. I know that's what Boston Uprising fans are running with, but I am not sold on it. And I honestly don't know anybody else who isn't a Boston delusional fan who will follow them die hard no matter what, that believes these guys are going to be able to replace them even remotely decently. Striker was incredible. But now he's gone, and Boston Uprising had to have the task of replacing that talent, which is almost impossible. Striker, in my opinion, is a top 5 DPS player in the world, and if you don't want to give him top 5, you have to. Absolutely have to give him top 10, no doubt. So they basically got rid of him and replaced him with what, in my opinion, is... Ugh, underwhelming DPS players. Let's let's take a look at who the two new DPS players are for the Boston Uprising. First, we have Blossé from the LA Gladiators Legion. Not bad. He played for a pretty good North American Contenders team. He placed third through fourth in the first season, and then in the second season they did okay, fifth through eighth. Not bad. Blossé's got some experience, not at the best level but it's kind of there. Maybe he can be developed, right? Dream Casper was good. We didn't expect it from him, so there's a chance for Blase. But moving on to the second DPS for this Boston Uprising team, we have Color Hex, who comes from the Oceanic region. He is going to be the second Oceanic player in the league. The first one is Custa, who, by the way, has been competing in North America and Europe his whole entire career, literally never competed in the Oceanic region. So yes, he is from that region, but he didn't compete in it. Color Hex is completely different. He has spent his whole entire career competing in the Oceanic division against Australian players and New Zealand players. And I hate to break it to you guys, this may be harsh and some of my Australian fans or Oceanic fans may not like to hear this, but the fact is that your region is underdeveloped compared to any of the main regions in Overwatch and any other esport in general. Sure, there's a chance that Color Hex is a god, the best player of all time, he came from the Oceanic region, but the odds are very slim just because he has never competed against top tier competition. Face the facts, guys. Those Australian and New Zealand players are nowhere near as good as anybody in the Overwatch League or anybody in Korean or North American or European contenders. Maybe there's some hidden individual talent, but overall the teams just aren't that good. And I understand I'm going hard, and again, I apologize to the Oceanic region, but that is just how I see it. That's how I think. And this guy is in no way even a good replacement for Mistake. I'm willing to give him a chance. I'm willing to see if the Boston Uprising really did sign this god from Australia or New Zealand. But I just don't see it happening. And this is the main reason why the Boston Uprising are going to struggle. They got some of the worst replacements possible 
four, two absolutely incredible players that made the Boston Uprising's first season extremely good. I really didn't want to mention Dream Casper in this video, but it has to be mentioned. I know the guy did something terrible, and he's not in the league anymore because of it, but he brought amazing performances to this team, and they really needed it when he did. I know he wasn't there for the full season, but let's be honest, after he got kicked off the team, mistakes came in, and he could not fill the shoes that Dream Casper did. Now let's talk about the third player who helped Boston Uprising be as good as they did in Season 1, and we have Note, who, thank God, is still going to be there in this season. We also have Gamsu. Don't think that I'm forgetting about Gamsu, guys. I just feel like he wasn't as much of a key to the team in Season 1 as players like Note and Striker or Dream Casper. Note's play was exceptional. He was one of the best off tanks in the league, in my opinion, if, and if it wasn't for space, he would be the best Western off tank in the league and in the world. The guy's very good at playing around his team and balancing what he needs to do for his teammates to keep them alive, as well as managing his own cooldowns and getting kills for the team when he needs to. All around, the guy just looks like a wizard on D.Va. And he could possibly be the saving grace for the Boston Uprising in Season 2, but it's just not going to be enough in my opinion. Honestly, I don't think an off-tank player in the Overwatch League can carry a below-average team from rank 18 to not even like rank 12, maybe at best rank 15 or 14, but that's it. Like, if it wasn't for No, I would have put this team at like 19 or 20. He really is the only reason that they're not looking at the last two ranks in the league and they're going to be the third last. I could sit here and talk more about Note being good, but you guys already know he performed very well in season one and I expect him to play decent in season two, but bringing it up again, now that those huge threats are gone, like Striker and Dreamcaster, Note is going to be the huge threat and he will probably get shut down a lot more this season. And now let's talk about Gamsu more. I know I mentioned him a little bit earlier, and I didn't say he was a key factor to this team. He was a big factor to why this team did good. No doubt about that. It's just that he wasn't a key factor. His Winston play was good, but he just wasn't the big threat on the team, and that gave him a lot of space, and I honestly think it made him look better than he really was. Now that they lost Striker, Dream Casper, and even Nako, guys, somebody who I haven't mentioned yet, losing Nako is going to be big. We saw Aim God play a few games last season, he wasn't the best, but I want to finish talking about Gamster real quick. What I was starting to say is that when you have these incredible players on your team, like Striker and Dream Casper, they create a lot of distraction on the map for a main tank player who isn't a big name like Gesture or Fisher who gets focused early on. That left Gamsu a lot of space and a lot of time to do what he wanted and create pressure without really getting checked. So that's like the big reason why I feel like, yes, Gamsu was a good player, he did help the team, but he is not going to be successful successful this season. He also is known to be a weak Reinhardt. Avast said it himself, a former Boston Uprising player on our talk show, that Gamsu just could not play Reinhardt and it's not his hero. He can't do it. Going into season one, it looks like Reinhardt is going to be a big part of the meta. So I could see him following out and possibly seeing Axiom get some start time or even see Fusions get brought up from the Academy team. And yeah, Fusions, he had an amazing World Cup performance, but he's still unproven at the highest level in the Overwatch League. So it's a question whether or not he is going to be a great player. He's also on the contract for two ways, so he can only play two games in a stage, which is a big hit. So just in general, I think there will be issues with the main tank role. And now moving on to the next point, which I just mentioned, we have Nako, who I don't think was like a major key player. He kind of sits in the same boat as Gamsu, probably looked a little bit better than he should have, just because there were some huge threats on the team that kind of took over and gave the space to Nako that allowed him to create plays that other Zenyatas couldn't just because they were bigger focus targets. Real quick, I want to play a game and I want to rank the best player players of Boston Uprising Season 1. Starting off with number 1, we have Striker. Number 2, we have Dream Casper. Number 3, we have Note. Number 4, we have Nako. Number 5, we have Gamsu. And number 6, we have Kalix, who we will get to Kalix later on. They literally lost 3 of their top 4 players. And if you want to put Gamsu ahead of Nako, sure, go ahead. I think Nako was better than Gamsu for this team. So according to my list, they lost their best players. 3 of their top 4 players are gone. They replaced them with average players. Uh, you can't even question that. Color Hex and Blase will not replace their DPS. Aim God, we saw him in Season 1. I wasn't really that impressed. So I think I rest my case when it comes to talking about the players that they lost and who they replaced them with. Now let's talk about the player that they didn't lose, who I just mentioned, Calyx. My goodness, the, if there was a guy they should have got rid of, it needed to be Calyx. And I really hate to dig into him right now, going into Season 2, 
but my god, did Kallax feed so hard in Season 1, he had the most deaths of any main support in the league. The guy was practically like a suicide machine in Overwatch, and I feel like Boston Uprising could have been even a better team, gone further in Season 1 if it wasn't for Kallax. They needed to get rid of Kallax in my opinion, the fact that they didn't really sucks and they potentially replaced him with a Brazilian player. And here we go again with Boston Uprising, thinking that they are incredible at signing unknown talent and it's going to work out for them again. I really think they went way too hard this season trying to sign players for cheap that they thought could be hidden gems. I just don't see Alameo taking any playtime from Kellex despite Kellex being a feed bot who just dies. Because Alameo is going to do the absolute same thing if he starts in the Overwatch League. I hate to say it, but the Boston Uprising made the biggest mistake by not replacing Calyx and signing a Brazilian main support. I feel bad for the South American region, like, I'm sure they have some good talent, but they just aren't proven, and I cannot, I cannot sit here and lie to you guys and say I think that this guy could be good. I just don't think so. That's my personal opinion, and if you disagree, you can disagree. I respect that. But look at the hidden gems that they signed during Season 1. They came from Korea. They came from North America. They didn't come from the Oceanic and South American divisions, guys. I just, I don't see it working out for the Boston Uprising. That's the main reason why I have them sitting at rank 18. This was a hard decision though. There are some other teams that aren't very good going into the next season, but I feel like Boston Uprising is worse out of all those left. Be sure to leave a comment down below letting me know if you disagree or agree. I'm sure I'm going to get flamed hard on this video because, I don't know, I just, I wasn't nice in it. I wanted to be honest with how I felt. Leave a comment down below, drop a like if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more daily Overwatch League content. I'm out of here guys, peace.